welcome everyone to this new Pathways Forum um, on resource hungry societies and the future in flux. In this forum, we will explore the concept of social metabolism and how it helps us uncover the underlying matter realities of our economic systems. In this regard, um, I am very happy to welcome our three speakers uh, today, which will be Helmut Haberle from the University uh, Université für Bodenkultur uh, Boku in Vienna, Anke Schapartek from the Central European University, and Eric Pinot from the University of Quebec. So this forum will be divided into two parts. Um, as usual, the first hours will be the first hour will be dedicated to presentations by guest speakers uh, on their work on social metabolism. Um, so Helmut will start with presenting the key concepts of social metabolism and the stock flow practice nexus that underlies it. Eric will be continuing by opening up economic theory beyond monetary terms, adding sources and things to the neoclassical um, scheme of production and consumption. And Anke will then enlighten us on how social metabolic perspectives can also help to envision and assess alternatives to capitalist economy. Um, after each presentation, you will have a couple of minutes to ask clarifying questions. Um, but please keep your discussion questions for the second half of our webinar, which will be dedicated entirely to exchange among the audience and the guest speakers. So just to clarify, clarifying questions are questions along the lines of, I did not understand this and this and this. Could you please clarify? <laughs> um, and discussion questions will please be held for the, the second part. And for the second part, I am then very happy to welcome um, Benjamin Fleischmann, who's a PhD candidate at Boku and alumni of our annual autumn school on sustainability science, who will be leading the discussion in the second part. So in this regard, um, I'm not gonna talk much more, so welcome all. And uh, without further ado, I will give the floor to our first speaker, Helmut Havale. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Thanks a lot. So I hope you can now see my my presentation. Um, yes, my topic is social metabolism. So basically, we discussed that I should start with a rather conceptual um, presentation that introduces the concept and explains a little bit um, how it can be applied. And this will be then followed by more presentations by Anke and, and Eric that show how this can be used in uh, to, to better understand uh, possible transitions, transformations towards sustainability. So basically the social metabolism concept, ah, this is not showing up in the, hmm, I should have tried whether I can change the slides. Can I click here? Ah, I can, I can click here. Okay. So you should now see the next slide, which shows a, a little bit the, this this whole concept. So the idea is to look at, at socioeconomic systems, at societies, for example, at national economies or the global economic system as a biophysical stock flow system. So we are interested in the material and energy resources that society extracts from the natural environment, like we do when we extract minerals and ores or fossil fuels, or when we harvest timber in a forest, or when we harvest uh, crops on cropland, or when animal livestock uh, feed itself and grazes uh, grass. Uh, and all these resources can be accounted for. They all flow into socioeconomic processing in production uh, and consumption systems. Uh, so usually we have several steps of production where uh, raw materials are converted into interim products and then eventually to final products that are distributed to consumers, to the population uh, that consumes these products. Uh, which also, of course, results in waste that may or may not be recycled. If they are not recycled, they are handed back to the environment. So we have flows, outflows of solid and liquid wastes, and that we have outflows of emissions to, to the air. Uh, and in this process, societies also build up material structures, like, for example, the buildings that we have, 
the infrastructures, the roads, the train systems, the, the factories, the houses in which we live, and all these things that we uh, build up to provide us with certain services uh, that are important for human well-being uh, and for other things as well, perhaps. Uh, it's important to stress here that there's two there's two ways to look at that. And this is stocks and flows. And this is a, a very important distinction in the sense that a stock is something that exists at a certain point in time. Like if you have a building at a certain point in time, it has a certain mass. It consists of certain materials and you can measure it in, in units of kilograms. Yeah? A flow characterizes a physical process occurring over a period of time. So, uh, of course, these the two are uh, uh, related. So, if we have inflows of materials, they may accumulate as material stocks over time. So, if we build more new houses, then we tear down old houses. We have a growth of the mass of houses in a society. Uh, and at the end of life of the products, products may flow to waste management sector, may be recycled, as I said, or they may flow back uh, to, uh, to the environment. And when we discuss these things, we have one really difficult cognitive challenge. So many people have difficulties uh, to distinguish stocks and flows and also to, to intuitively understand how they are related. So for example, if you have this simple thing like a bath tube and you have a constant outflow of water, which we usually try to avoid, but, uh, but in this case, we have a faulty bath tube, which uh, leaks water and we have a water inflow and we have this graph showing this constant outflow, kilogram water per second, uh, and we show an inflow that changes like that. Can You can see my mouse, right? Yeah, so the inflow changes like that. So it's turned up, then it's turned down again. So the inflow re is reduced and it, yeah. Where do you expect that? I, you know, I will not take answers, but just ask yourself, where do you expect the maximum and the minimum of the water table to be in, in this time series? Well, who guessed right? Think about it. it. It's no shame if you don't, because this is something that is really hard for us to understand. That's we have our brains work in a correlative manner. So we use usually we, we would expect that this is the maximum, but it is not the maximum. The maximum is here. Yeah. So because at that point the outflow is larger than the inflow, and at that point the water table starts to fall. And the lowest value is not here, but it's here, because until here, uh, the inflow is smaller than the outflow, right? So just to think about, this is not something easy to understand, even though the process is extremely simple, yeah? Uh, and understanding this correlation between inflows and outflows is not easy, but that's what we have to deal with when we think about social metabolism. Uh, Okay, and so this buildup of material stocks in social metabolism is of crucial importance because in many cases, it's not the flow alone that provides us with a certain service, but we always or in almost all instances, we need a combination of stocks and flows. So if we want to be mobile, for example, it doesn't help us at all to have gasoline. We need gasoline and the car and the road. Otherwise, we cannot move with the help of gasoline better than without it. Actually, we can move easily, more easily without the gasoline because then we don't have to carry it, right? Without a car and a road, gasoline hinders our mobility. It doesn't provide us with mobility. So it's always the con combination of stocks and flows that provides us with, with certain services and ultimately with, with well-being. In an economic sense, and I think Eric will follow up on that, stocks constitute fixed assets and capital. Uh, stocks have long lifetimes and they create lock-ins of future patterns. And I guess Anke might talk about that a little more, perhaps. 
uh, for example, if we have certain settlement and infrastructure patterns, then we will be more likely to be mobile in a different manner, depending on where we live in such a system. I will show some examples. Stocks also constitute reservoirs for future secondary resources, and therefore the, all of that makes them key for energy efficiency, greenhouse gas uh, reduction measures, uh, circular economy, and so on. So this is just some numbers. This is global material flows on the left-hand side. So you see biomass, which more or less rises along with human population. You see fossil fuels. So this runs from 1900 to 2015. And you see this whole explosion of use of fossil energy, which of course is the primary driver behind the climate crisis. You see metals, you see minerals. Uh, those flows accumulate in a different, uh, to a different extent. So for example, most of the biomass, not all, but most is used dissipatively for nourishing ourselves in this bioenergy and for rather short-lived products. Some is used for long-lived products, like for example, timber in houses, but most is used for short-lived products. Fossil fuels is almost all used dissipatively. A small part is used for plastics and those may be more long-lived, which also may create problems. And the metals and the, the mineral resources, they are the main constituents of this growth of human-made material stocks. So at this graph, you see material stocks in, in the global economy. Uh, and just for comparison, these 1,000 gigatons, so 1,000 billion tons, that's about the same mass as all organisms on planet Earth have, in brackets, if you dry them, hypothetically. We don't want to dry ourselves, certainly, because we don't survive it, and, and the plants also don't survive it. But if we were to dry ourselves completely to bone dry biomass materials, that would be the mass all of the biomass on planet Earth has. So we have become quite large in this sense. Okay. Uh, and we can also look at this, uh, the share of stock building materials in all the material flows, all the extraction of materials globally uh, has risen dramatically. So we put ever more of these resources we extract on stocks. Okay, I will skip over this. You can use this concept to, for example, look at the circularity of the global economy and you find it's not, not very good. Um, there is one key concept that has lost a lot of credit for good reasons. Um, so this is the concept of, of decoupling. Yeah? Of course, there is no reason not to try to decouple human well-being from resource use. The problem is that the strategies, the efficiency strategies that are currently implemented usually only result in what is called relative decoupling. So we have some decoupling between economic activity and human well-being uh, and resource use, but the rate of decoupling is too slow to allow absolute reductions in resource use. And that's what we would require to deal with our sustainability targets. We can discuss that a little more. We've done a review on that to back that up. I cannot do that now. Uh, the one important thing here is, so if we look at, uh, we can you look at resource efficiency in a much more comprehensive manner with the stock flow service nexus idea. So here we really appreciate that it's always a combination of stocks and flows that generate certain services, certain well-being contributions. Uh, and if we take that seriously, we may perhaps find ways of achieving the, 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 the services that we need or want to have a good life for all people on earth. Uh, but this means we also have to change the patterns of our stocks. We cannot just say, well, we, we just reduce the ratio between economic activity and flows, uh, which brings us to a difficult question, which is what actually is a service? Many people, when they talk about services, talk about what I would call function. 
for example, in the, and I stick with the mobility examples today, uh, many people talk about, uh, for example, person kilometers or ton kilometers as indicators uh, of services. I would call that a function. So moving a person from here to another place is a function, but actually uh, we have to think about why we want to move from point A to point B and where on the surface of Earth are the points A and B that we want to connect. Uh, and if we think about that in that manner, we may want to be mobile because we want to have social inclusion. We want to be included in the work process. We want education, healthcare, groceries, daily demands, leisure, and so on. And then perhaps... Uh, not moving at all or moving a far shorter distance may be a much better solution than moving people over many kilometers. So I think person kilometers is not a good goal function, right? So that's not a goal we should have. Uh, and there are just two examples. So if I have compare a daily commute of one kilometer, which I can do on foot or by a bicycle, with a daily commute of 30 kilometers by car, I have much fewer person kilometers with a one kilometer commute. And I may even have health benefits and well being benefits because it's a nice thing to do to walk one kilometer or to go by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by bike for one kilometer, even, even more so if it's a nice environment. And, and 30 kilometer commute maybe is very expensive and it's perhaps not, not at all pleasant. Um, okay, so you can use this concept to quantify things. I have to skip over that. Uh, I want to also get to this concept. So the, the, the core idea here being that the structures within which we live shape our daily routines. Uh, and this you can understand if you use the social science concept of practices of daily routine activities of people. And they are characterized by three core elements, by materials and infrastructures, by knowledge and skills, and by socially shared tastes and meanings. An example from mobility again, uh, be, you can be mobile using very different means of transport, for example. You can also be mobile and reach your goals by moving over very different uh, distances. Uh, and the meaning component may, for example, be if you go to a meeting, it will depend on which people you meet, uh, what it means if you arrive with a Mercedes Benz or an SUV, or if you arrive on foot or with a bicycle. Yeah? In a group of scientists who work on global climate change issues, if you arrive with an SUV or a Mercedes Benz, this may not be a good appearance, right? Uh, if you are the CEO of an international corporation and you arrive on foot, you may be judged very differently, right? So this this is the meaning component. The, the knowledge component here is, of course, it, to be able to move by car, you have to have you have to know how to drive it, and legally you also need a driver's license. So otherwise, you cannot go by car. And if you want to go by bicycle, you need to have a bicycle, and you need to how to drive it. The material component would be, and the infrastructure component would be, you need bike lanes, you need roads, and so on. You need the car, you need the bicycle, and so on. Yeah. So that's kind of a concept with which you can try to understand the relations between, uh, between social metabolism, the daily routines of people, and uh, and their well-being, the, the well-being they can achieve. So. I will stop here. The slides will, of course, be shared. And there are a few more slides you may look at and perhaps ask questions in the discussion. Thanks a lot for the attention. Thank you very much, Helmut. Um, if uh, we have maybe a little bit of time to get take some clarifying questions, uh, you have a question. Don't hesitate to raise your hand um, and ask your question or ask it in the chat. Um, yeah, clarifying questions. <laughs> and if there are no questions, maybe you need a little bit of time to think. 
But if there are no questions, um, we can move, move on to the second presentation. Um, so Eric, I will invite you to share your screen. And, yeah, uh, great. I'll do that right now. Okay. And I'll give you the floor. And there we go. Okay, so I'm going to share with you. Um, <clears throat> it's an, an application of the um, of the social metabolic model um, to um, questions of political economy. How we can use the um, stock flow uh, practice model to understand um, capitalism as an economic system and as a biophysical or a material system. Um, so I'll start with, well, I think I'll go quickly over the introduction to social ecology. Um, Helmut has done it um, and, um, and jump into to point three um, as fast as I can to look at how we can um, look at the economic process as a metabolic structure and, and how capitalism fits into that, um, into that picture. It's based on a book that I wrote uh, that, was, um, that came out last year called The Social Ecology of Capital. Um, Maybe maybe um, some some quick remarks, uh, just introductory remarks to remind ourselves that social ecology um, is an, an interdiscipline that that literally asks the question of the nature of the ecological relations of society, and we can say that this can be looked at in two different angles. On the one hand, um, this is a classical distinction in ecology. Autoecology would be the relationship between um, a being and his habitat, and this gives us social metabolism. And then we can look at the relations between living beings, and this is synecology, and this would be the study of colonization, which is another branch of social ecology. And I'll be focusing just on the first branch. Um, as as um, Helmut um, has shown, we have the, the, the capacity to, to represent the material flows that make um, our economies. Um, and um, maybe I think the, the, the important um, or key uh, idea in this um, from, my, from my point of view is that um, these flows and these stocks are instituted um, in the economic process. And I think that's the, the important, the most important um, concept here. Um, Eric, so, so, Eric, sorry, yes. I don't want to interrupt, but we don't see your slides moving. You don't see? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you, you, since the very beginning? We were only seeing the first uh, title slide. Why is it? Okay, it says it, it's paused yeah okay um this has never happened to me before i i will transform this right away into a pdf i guess this is keynote that is the problem i'm mm -hmm. sorry about this um hmm. oh, this sorry. Is very <laughs> strange okay uh do i have this in pdf i should have it in pdf okay there i'll try again sorry about that so after the first everything kind of died out right yeah we only saw the title slide <sighs> So now, can you see? Yeah. Okay. So this is the book. Sorry about this. Okay. Um, and then, well, I'll just, yeah, sorry about this. Okay, I'll, I'll keep on. So as um, Helmut showed, we, we have a, a the, the concept that I worked with in my, in my book was the idea of linear throughput. Um, basically, um, um, looking at what flows through society, um, which must be extracted and which will be dissipated. And um, this is tied to, to material flow analysis categories, which, which we use when we, when we calculate these flows. And, and, and this is tied to the different forms that materials take as they flow through society. Um, these categories here are, are, are categories for us, for human beings. I think the, the material entities don't know that they have take on these different guises. So this is important to understand that these are social and symbolic categories. Um, um, that that organize the way materiality flows through society. Um, so materials flow um, from our raw, raw materials become used values and eventually become waste. And the important thing is the metamorphosis from one category, um, you can see my mouse usually, to another is a social process of, um, um, it, it is not a, it is not a, functional process the 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 if we take um, the transformation of of use values into waste um well this process um is not necessarily tied to 
uh, material use uh, uh, and in the sense of being used up, um, the decision to 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 make waste is a social process. Um, okay, um, now when we start to, to to open up the box of of political economy and and um, material flows of social metabolism, um, there's one important um, relation that we have to work with, um, and it's the um, relation between value and entropy. Um, to add value in the economic process um, is an entropic process, and, and there's no way out of this um, relationship between um, biophysical work, which implies entropy, and value. Um, that is not to say that we have to collapse value and entropy. Um, I think that uh, value is a social process of valorization, entropy is a biophysical process, and one should not confuse one with the other. So I would, but one has to recognize that there are two places of impossibility. You cannot have value added in the economic process without entropic transformations. So this is against this whole idea that we could have a dematerialized economy. And on the other hand, um, in our economic um, system, one cannot have biophysical work, one cannot access significant amounts of biophysical work, um, energy, materials without capitalist social relations. Um, in other economic configurations, it would be possible, but in our economic system, valorization and, and entropy are tied together, um, but one should not collapse one into the other. Um, in social metabolism, we work with um, the idea of meta metabolic regimes, and it's important to understand the nature of these regimes to understand how capitalism develops. Um, Capitalism emerges in an agrarian regime, um, but it takes off um, and, and becomes a hegemonic economic system in the fossil industrial metabolic regime. Um, there, have, there was, um, during this fossil industrial um, metabolic regime, there was a period where there was socialist economies organized according to different principles, um, and, 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 um, but but um, the development, the takeoff of the um, both of capitalist growth and of fossil industrial regimes, they're intimately tied one with the other. Um, rapidly, um, what I'd like to highlight from this table is, is the idea that um, the surplus form and the development form are, are radically different. In an agrarian regime, your development pattern is very cyclical. You have a metabolic base, a metabolic ceiling, um, and you have diminishing returns as you invest into productive capacity because you're investing in ecological relations which are at one point limited in their productivity by net primary production. Um, in this metabolic regime, um, the economic surplus um, has, uh, has to be produced and is harvested ex post. Um, in the fossil regime, <coughs> sorry, um, we notice that we have growth instead of a cyclical pattern of development. Um, this growth is continuous and we have rising returns in the sense that as we apply um, oil, coal and gas to the extraction of oil, coal and gas, we get more oil, coal and gas. Um, this is something that, that, that has been studied um, in, in energy, energy studies. Um, and maybe the important thing um, is that the surplus form is a pre-existing mass of fossilized energy. Um, um, and the, 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 the constraint in this system is not to generate a surplus, but it is to extract, and I, I, I wrote burn, but um, um, extract and dissipate productively for capital, the surplus. That's the, that's the challenge. And that's why thermodynamics becomes a very central discursive feature of, of these of these um, economies. Um, and, and then one could say that in the relationship to nature in general in agrarian societies is ecological. We are um, enmeshed in relations with plants, with, um, with animals. Animal labor is central to these, to these societies. Um, whereas in, in, in the fossil industrial regime, um, um, our relations are more to abiotic um, aspects of the, of the of nature, um, which become core determinants of our of our um, of our metabolism, and I could go more in, in detail maybe in the discussion. Um, 
So that's uh, so we'll be working with this down here with this with this model here of fossil industrial metabolism. Um, again, capitalism emerged in an agrarian setting, but was limited in its development and found in the fossil industrial re regime um, a material base to develop um, uh, and to become what it is today. So now turning to um, the economic process as a as a metabolic process from and, and this um, way of organizing um, um, the economic process is typical of capitalism. I wouldn't use this structure to understand other economies, in particular agrarian economies. I'm not sure it would be relevant to all cases. I think it was really developed um, um, to understand capitalism. Um, usually when we political economy, when we're interested in, um, in understanding um, capitalist relations, um, we tend to focus on two relations, production and consumption. Um, and our economic, uh, the representations we have of the economic process are, are limited to these two relations. Um, from a metabolic point of view, we have to work with four structures, um, which each being a site of capital accumulation, each being a site of, um, of valorization, of exploitation, and, 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 and each having um, a, a certain degree of autonomy relative to the other moments. Of course, you can't produce things that have not been extracted productively transform, sorry, things that not have been um, extracted. And you cannot, of course, dissipate um, a materialities that have not been extracted, produced and consumed. But there are autonomous logics or independent logics at each of these points. And one of the interesting features of, of, of this approach is to try to understand how the, the independent function of extraction or productive transformation, consumptive transformation or dissipation impacts the overall metabolic structure of the economic process. Um, so um, this is maybe a, a, a more um, 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 precise way of representing these relations. Um, um, and this kind of takes this idea of entropy um, and valorization. So you still have this kind of axis down here of entropy and this axis here of, of valorization. Um, and, and we see that how materials change form as they move through the economic process. Um, so, so the material flow or the throughput um, emerges in the economic process as raw materials, is transformed into use values and becomes waste as, uh, as it is dissipated. And here's a, a way to, to bring this whole um, structure together. Um, um, so valorization, um, um, is, is the process from extraction to production. Once val value is created, it must be realized in the sense that, that we must have effective demand. This effective demand can be individual or it can be collective. We can collectively consume what has been produced. And eventually um, um, what is, is, exists in the, uh, in the economy as use values will be wasted. And this waste process is capitalistically determined um, in a sense that there is an inbuilt waste relation in all the um, elements that, that, that are produced in a capitalist economy. Um, and then there is uh, accumulation at this point, which um, can take the form of incineration systems, of renewable natural gas um, um, facilities, um, of, of dumps, of, of, of this massive flow of e-waste that we see all over the world. So, so there is accumulation at this point, just as there is accumulation here at this point of extraction. Now, material stocks, as um, Helmut insisted on this aspect, that um, that uh, that stocks are, are, are an important feature of our, our metabolism, and I think the one thing that that is important um, um, to um, highlight from the political economy point of view um, is that as we moved, um, you can you can kind of draw a line here in the 1950s, um, as the capitalist um, world economy matured and became hegemonic. We moved from a from a, 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 metabol a social metabolism dominated by flows, and and you see here the massive amount of, of feed that is going through the metabolic profile of, of of our societies, which is tied to animal labor, and which is um, to a society where the accumulation of stocks of material stocks becomes the overall um, dynamic. And and what's important to understand from a um, and I've got a, a bunch of examples of these here. Um, what is important um, to understand um, from a political economy point of view is that property relations is what organizes the existence 
of stocks. Um, so um, this brings me to 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 work um, differently to build on what um, um, Helmut has developed um, uh, the stock flow practice nexus and to widen the notion of practice to power structures, institutions, and more generally social relations. Um, and to also look at material stocks as objects of property relations. Um, and this is a, a, a bit uh, an insight into how we can work with this. So I'm looking at um, maybe the, 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 the same activity, which could be, um, um, let's say a lumber yard where, where a sawmill, um, a sawmill where we're transforming trees into, into construction wood. And from the perspective of capital, um, and this is drawn from Marx's um, capital, but it's kind of traditional uh, political economy uh, perspective. Um, from the perspective of capital, um, um, through investment, um, the sawmill appears as a, uh, the, the sawmill, which is a stock, a material stock that is accumulated, appears as fixed capital. That, um, 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 and what flows through the sawmill um, appears as a commodified flow of um, bearing value. So from trees, we end up with the commodity, which would be construction wood. Um, and the social practice that we have that is organizing this whole relation is, is a practice where we try to extract value from trees um, um, through the existence of a stock, a material stock, which is a fixed capital, which is, which is a sawmill. Um, looking at the same activity from the perspective of labor, what do we have? Well, we, here we have a labor process, so somebody that is embedded in an employment relation. Um, his work is mediated by the sawmill, not seen as fixed capital, but seen as a machine, a tool that is an extension of his capacity to transform, um, to transform um, material re reality. And what he, um, what flows through the sawmill is use values in this sense, um, um, which can be then used to construct ho houses like, like what's behind me. Um, so the stock flow capital nexus is a way to organize the stock flow practice nexus, but looking at how the practice practices of capitalism um, are a specific form um, of social practice that imply um, economic relations that are embedded in these material relations. And, and the idea, which is basic to stock flow practice analysis, is that you cannot have one tier without the other. So you cannot have valorization without fixed capital and a commodified flow. You cannot have employment without um, um, means of productions, with energized means of productions, and a flow of use values. And you cannot have a commodified flow without stock, uh, fixed capital and a valorization process. So this is what uh, this, this approach gives us. Um, and then if we take this, and I won't go through this whole slide because I have about four minutes left. Um, if we take this and bring it inside our, 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 our four moments of the economic process, then we can see how each moment of the economic process has these this three-tier structure, and it can be a very powerful analytical tool to understand production, consumption, waste, and extraction. Um, so, um, I talked a bit about capital. I just wanted to say um, um, in a few minutes that when I examine capital and capitalism, I examine it through a post-Keynesian Marxian approach. Um, capital is a social relation, not a thing, though, though fixed capital is a materiality, but fixed capital can also be in intangible forms such as patents and and, and design and 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 brands. Um, it can also be an intangible um, form. Um, but uh, basically, the the framework that I use to understand capitalism looks at um, corporations as the main capitalist actors, um, and this gives us a very specific um, insight into how the throughput. Um, is organized, and I won't read everything that's on a slide, and they'll be available, and it's all in the book. But um, basically, it, it means that um, um, it, there's a very specific way in which fixed capital, in particular, um, um, organizes at each point of the metabolic process the flow. Um, one of the issues with with fixed capital is its inertia. Uh, corporations are 
um, always actively trying to protect their investments from devalorization. And this introduces a lot of inertia in our system. Um, and this is important for sustainability studies, um, this inertia. And, and just to finish, um, one of the uses of the approach that I tried to develop is also to help actors struggling in environmental, um, um, environmental conflicts to, to, to understand um, um, these conflicts through a metabolic lens. Um, and, and this is a picture of, of a clear cut in Quebec. And um, what we're trying to understand here is not the fact that trees have been cut, but um, the, 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 the environmental um, um, debate or, or controversy we have over what's left. Do we leave it there or do we transform it into energy? Which is a big debate we're having in Quebec, and I think we're having this elsewhere in the world around bioenergy. And um, this is how it, this is the ultimate. This is the real source of 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 um, energy that um, our gas corporations are licking into tapping into. This is what they want to extract, but this is what they present in their in their um, in their advertisements. Basically, that uh, these. Um, banana peels and these apple cores are what we could extract gas from, um, not this dirty, muddy, um, clear cut. And, um, and then this is how we, just to show you that, you know, the, for us, the social metabolism is a language that we can use to um, visibilize um, these, um, these, these debates that we're having. And, and this is an example of um, what, I, what I prepared for for movements here in Quebec on how to understand natural renewable gas as a, as a, as a metabolic and capitalist process. So it's an example of how we can apply this. Um, that's uh, basically what I wanted to share. Um, it's just an insight into a small superficial insight into the work that I've done. And I'm, I'm really happy to be able to, to share it with you. And maybe we can discuss some aspects later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, um, for this presentation. And if you, if there are any clarifying questions, we can quickly um, answer them. Um, I see one in the chat. Uh, someone's asking if the previous figure of biophysical impossibility and capitalism impossibility is also from your book. Uh, I see a yes. So <laughs> I suppose that's. Oh, a... sorry. Yeah, it is. It, it is. I, I don't have the page in front of me, but it, it, I can find the page. But yes, it's there. It will be. Um, the book will be in the reading list that we will be sharing yeah, yeah, at, yeah, the, end yeah, the, at the end of the at the end of the forum and after the forum as well. Um, if there are no more clarifying questions, we can move on to Anke uh, Anke's presentation. Um. Oh, wait, sorry. I think I a, yeah, a question just came up, exactly. A question came up. Uh, if you want to ask a question, Otone. Oh, Otone. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, hello. Thank you very much for your presentation. And sorry to have raised the end just uh, at the end of the of the poll. And thanks for, for the presentation. I just had a question when uh, you showed a slide comparing the meta different metabolic regimes uh, earlier in your presentation. You you actually do a, a net distinction between fossil industry and agriculture. So I imagine also it might include industrial agriculture, for example, and the, the impacts that come from. And um, my question would be like how this kind of framework or conceptual framework might in integrate as well the links between ecological regimes and geological regimes, which are finally not so much distinct between themselves, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, what I what I did in the book, and, and of course, this could imply further work, but um, I started from the premise that um, in in the fossil industrial re regime, um, agricultural production is fossilized. There's a fossil mediation that is necessary um, in agriculture. This is um, actually um, uh, net primary production is actually dependent on energy input. So our agricultural system is an energy sink, not an energy source. In most systems, um, then there are some border. Uh, th then there's the question of the forest, where in the case of the forest, the, it is not a sink; it is a source of of. But we don't use tendentially have stopped using our forests as energy sources, and and use them more as as, as stock building sources. Um, so so then you would have not a. It's not a. F it's not fossilized in the sense that. Um, 
agriculture is, but it is still um, subsumed to the fossil to the fossil logic. You could have a third case, which would be a kind of um, articulated. So you would have um, a, a, a a country which or or a society sorry which is or a class of peasants which are still in these ecological relations um and then we would have a an extractive a purely extractive relation to this um to this uh, uh production where that where a capitalist system would extract in a non-reproductive way a surplus um without in w without a a fossil mediation that would be like the third the third um the, the third uh yeah example maybe we can get in maybe during the discussion so so there's room for for articulation but there's three cases so the first case is fossil net primary production which is agriculture today industrial agriculture that's what we have the second case would be um um fossil mediated extraction which is what we do in the forest sector um and then the third case would be just a, a purely extractive parasitical relation of capital to peasant production. Um, um, that would be the third case, I guess, that we would see. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And I think uh, we will have maybe the time later to further go deeper in the, deeper in the discussion anyway. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. All right. If there are no more clarifying questions this time, we can go to um, Anke, An Anke's presentation. All right. Um, and maybe as I'm shutting, setting up my screen share, I saw that there are a lot of uh, alumni from the last Future Earth Autumn School there. So hi, everyone. It's good to see you or at least to know that you're there. Uh, and I also saw some of my CEU students, which I think is really nice. Um, so welcome as well. Uh, I think I have everything set up. Do you see the uh, but now I don't see you. So you, do you see my first slide? Yes. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, so what I wanted to do is uh, to talk a little bit um, and then also especially to think and discuss with everyone uh, in terms of, you know, what we can get out of um, uh, using these social uh, metabolic tools or the social metabolic perspective. And I say get out of social metabolism um, because I've heard often that as humans, we're supposedly only interested in our own gains, right? So we always need to know what can I get out of this? So that's why we're starting with this. Um, a little bit of like not a not so serious comment, of course. So um, if we think about um, social metabolism, as we've also now heard, right, um, as a uh, an understanding of society uh, as simultaneously uh, and also somewhat convolutedly maybe uh, being something sociocultural and biophysical, right? Um, that is as society uh, of society is actually having a social metabolism. Um, then this kind of thinking about society first and foremost is the prerequisite to the development of the very tools such as uh, material and energy flow accounting or stock and flow accounting, um, of which we've now already seen some of the results that have been shared, but such tools that enable us to quantitatively track societal resource use across levels of scale. And uh, this understanding is also the prerequisite to the understanding uh, that societal resource use is determined by the principles of societal organization rather than by individual wants and needs. And this is something that both Helmut and Eric have already shown in their presentation and have documented with data and with uh, with uh, even data that focuses on, on different contexts. Um, but if we think about what we what we see in terms of environmental policies, then sometimes it's this is almost surprising because so often it's individual wants and needs that are addressed when it comes to solving problems. Um, and this is actually not what we see as the maybe the main lever if we're looking at this from a sociometabolic perspective. So what I'll try to do in the next 10 minutes is to explore extremely briefly what we can gain from applying um, a socio-metabolic perspective to questions of globally growing resource extraction and consumption, especially in the light of, and this is where my title comes in, underlying uh, inequalities at the sub-global level. 
And then what I really hope that we can have plenty of time to discuss, and if this is something that's also of interest uh, to you, um, that to discuss how we might need to further develop and also expand upon social metabolism research in order to capture not just some of its main narratives or what have traditionally been its main narratives, but other narratives as well about what the problems are and how we might address them. And with that, I'd like to start out with something that I see uh, as, in a way, one of the, one of the narratives, a narrative um, that is commonly linked to social metabolism research. Um, and that's the narrative of the impossibility of indefinite growth on a physically finite planet. And this narrative usually starts out with something, or at least an imagination of something like the Earthrise photo that you see here. So this. Uh, idea of our planet as this little blue vulnerable ball that's floating in vast dark space um, and that really drives home this idea that the planet we call home is physically finite right um and of course as such it can clearly not sustain unlimited growth um at the same time um from the looks of it uh and from a socio-metabolic perspective the recent past has been particularly marked by one trend, and that's that of growth, right? And so now we're already getting into something that seems kind of contradictory. On the one hand, we're trying to argue very clear that we can't keep growing forever. On the other hand, we're in a system and in a situation uh, in which we have this continued growth tra trajectory. And of course, this idea that everything is growing, right, is exemplified. You can see it in some of the images here by the great acceleration charts that were compiled by uh, Will Stefan and his colleagues. Um, so something that I think we're very in tune with, that this is part of the issue, that everything is growing and this is happening on a physically finite planet. Um, and in uh, the Netflix documentary, he produced uh, one of Will Steffen's colleagues, Johan Ruckström, um, shows us or tries to show us uh, what this means, this continued growth, even on a, on a limited planet. Um, and the way we see it visualized in this documentary, maybe some of you have seen it, um, we see it visualized as humanity, and humanity are these little grayish blue figures that you see on your screens now. Humanity incessantly marching forward out of the green zone that you can see in the background there, um, the safe operating space, into the yellow um, in the front of the, of the image here, and then for some planetary boundaries, in which we can't see yet in this image, uh, into the red danger zone. And this animation, um, is of course uh, the well fancy version uh, of probably of a figure that I assume is quite well known, um, so that of the planetary boundaries, right, where we also see this safe operating space, and then we're we're moving uh, forward, seemingly into these dangerous zones, um, and on the one hand, this is pro this is a very a powerful image, of course, and, and I assume also one that was because of its communicative power is quite widely known. On the other hand, of course, it also raises some questions, right? How can we, if we're uh, breaking boundaries, as I think the, the documentary is called, how can we keep breaking these boundaries? Are they there or are they not there? How can we keep marching forward if we're already in the red? So here, just in terms of the narrative, maybe this raises some questions. Um, and I think that we can maybe further approach what might be our issues uh, with, with what's going on there if we actually take a moment. And again, from a, we can do this from a sociometabolic perspective, if we look under the hood uh, of global growth, right? And then if we look at that, we have to acknowledge um, that actually we are quite far from all marching in the same direction as this animation maybe suggests, or all marching to the same tune. Um, but that the extractive expansion that we see and as kind of one of, I, I also always, um, I, I always produce these curves that show things are growing and um, I also have for a long time. Um, but that if we, if we look at kind of um, this extractive expansion and the detrimental envir environmental impacts uh, that that has and that occur elsewhere, uh, from the perspective of the raging consumption, which is thus sustained, then we begin to understand that, well, at least there are, at the very least, there are two different things happening here, right? Um, 
which both have to do with this with these growth trends, but which both kind of relate to uh, these overarching growth trends in a very different manner. Um, and of course, this is something that uh, is then, if we analyze this further, we find that actually in, in these periods of global growth or what we refer to as, as global growth, um, the growth in resource use is not at all global uh, or not at, at least not international. It happens at the aggregate level, yes, but it's marked by very dark international differences. Uh, and this is a slide that uh, some of you have definitely already seen from me and that I, I use a lot, even though I know that the the, the image is kind of um, not very high quality, um, but I have yet to make something uh, that is a bit stronger on the communication side. But what we're looking at here um, are uh, lines that for each of the years between 1960 and unfortunately only up to 2010 um, show the distribution of uh, population um, and uh, the rate at which the metabolic rate, so the rate at which uh, they consume resources at the national average. Um, so this means that what we, maybe the thing that one can see, even though the graph is kind of not very intuitive, is that over time, so as we move from the dark blue line that is 1960, um, across the 1980s and 90s in green and blue, and then 2000 to 2010, which is the last uh, data point that, or the last time point that we have, um, we see that uh, increasingly this graph actually has two, uh, um, two peaks in a way, right? And what this is indicative of is that we're seeing um, a very, uh, an increasing uh, inequality, but a very specific type of inequality in um, per capita, average per capita resource use, which is that of polarization. Um, so it's becoming increasingly likely to say it in very simple uh, or simplifying terms that people live either in a country in which national consumption corresponds to half the global average, so to five tons per capita in 2010, or that they live in a country in which uh, per capita consumption um, corresponds to twice the, uh, the global average, so 20 tons per capita in 2010. And on the one hand, this means that within these very low or very high consuming groups of countries, we have reduced inequality because they're uh, more similar. It means that internationally, we're seeing this, this polarization and we're seeing increased um, inequality. And this, of course, is only, uh, it's not, the, the, the only issue isn't the, the graph and its quality or, or that it's only up to 2010, but of course, also it's only at the national level, right? So we are not even beginning to look at here that within each of these countries, um, there are further inequalities. And it's really uh, no coincidence that these period, this period in which we see growing global growth and resource use and this increasing type of a very specific inequality, um, it's no coincidence that they coincide. So Western industrialization, which is often explicitly and implicitly, or which often explicitly and implicitly serves as uh, the blueprint for development, Western industrialization is unthinkable without net imports. Um, so without the appropriation, or perhaps depending on, on the specific situation, we're looking at the plunder of resources from elsewhere, right? Um, but these net imports, they have to stem from somewhere, uh, and they do require material inequality because they require, uh, we cannot have net imports without net exports. So uh, they require inequality between material net importers and net exporters. Um, of course, this translates to a certain inequality between sites of extraction and consumption um, that are not uh, the, uh, located uh, in the same territoriality. And uh, also, uh, to a large extent, between the mines of the past and the often called urban mines of the future, right? And from the uh, perspective, especially of the Western industrialized countries and the global north, it's of course, it's no coincidence that we're beginning to think about uh, possibilities for urban mining now at this stage in development when actually we are in the global north sitting on uh, quite substantial mines and 
and metal content or ore grades uh, in many of the mines around the world are, is, is decreasing because the high, high grade ores have already been extracted. Um, and what this means, if we take it together, of course, is that in contrast to popular claims uh, that this could be a blueprint for development, that this is a blueprint that can never be implemented everywhere because not all countries can be net importers and that uh, they require uh, net exports, right? So it's not, it cannot become universal. And I assume that uh, probably to none of you listening, much of this is a surprise. Um, and I would assume that most of us are actually quite aware that a lot of what we consume in the global north comes from elsewhere, that there are many, um, and there are many uh, important initiatives to kind of put that elsewhere on the map, right? To not to make it as vague, to, for, uh, to enable us to look at um, supply and use chains for individual products, for sectors. Uh, these types of things, whether it's for food, as you can uh, see uh, alluded to in the image here, or whether it's for phones, yeah. where we, we have studies now yeah. that enable us to look at uh, uh, where the different metals or uh, materials in such phones come from, right? Um, but actually, I would say all too easily, this knowledge that we do have becomes tangled up in concerns about the security of supply. And if you look closely, you can see that in uh, uh, the, this, this image that I've shared here with you. So security of supply, geopolitical issues, right? Or sometimes like the, this idea of the sorry state of environmental protection elsewhere, right? So the problem is we're importing um, from areas that have poor environmental legislation. And this is a nod towards that very legislation and to trade policies and oftentimes has actually extremely racist overtones as well. Another way to look at these links might actually be to concern ourselves uh, with the unpaid care work that's provided by uh, environmental defenders at the sites uh, of extraction. And what I'm sharing here um, is a screenshot of the Environmental Justice Atlas. Um, and that en Environmental Justice Atlas is kind of one tool that might help us uh, to do so and to have a look at the work of these environmental defenders. And every dot that you see here on the map represents an environmental distribution conflict. When this atlas was in its infancy or in the very early stages of, of uh, its development, uh, one of the hopes was that we would be able to show that more extraction means more conflict. Um, so that uh, that we would, uh, with the data we have from social metabolism studies, we would be able to see where is there where is extractive expansion happening in quantitative terms, and then probably, or that was our expectation, there would be more conflicts where that extraction is happening. Um, and uh, of course, part of that idea was also that people the world over, even those living in conditions of what is described as material and energy poverty are not interested, to say the very least, in supporting a growth-led economic system. And unfortunately, or maybe not so unfortunately, this is something that we weren't able to verify. And initially it was disappointing, but in fact, um, I think that if you look into these cases in the Atlas, you will find that for the environmental defenders locally, it isn't about growth. And of course, if we think about it, that makes a lot of sense. How could it be, right? Um, so at the local level, global growth trajectories are not readily visible, which is part of the reason why we have this fancy animation in Rockstream's documentary, because we're trying to kind of visualize what does this even mean, global growth, right, for us individually. Um, but what is visible, of course, locally and very strongly visible is the violent destruction of human uh, and more than human life. And this happens uh, it can happen regardless sort of of the level of uh, extraction, right? And this is uh, what is contested. And I think what would be kind of really nice uh, potentially to discuss if you're interested is of course to think about more, uh, to think more about what this means. So whether in juxtaposing the outcomes of social metabolism research and the claims of environmental defenders, we can ask, um, how can we disentangle accounting practices such as material and energy uh, stock and flow accounting from their use in and for productivity uh, increases in capitalist growth? How can we go from the reductionism of our ton fetishism, uh, which uh, maybe you've already noticed that if we're looking at materials, we look at tons and tons per capita, to acknowledging the diversity of languages of valorization 
And both terms, one very officially, the other not so officially, are uh, Joan Martínez Alviers, who those of you currently in, in at ICTA in Barcelona uh, have probably seen there. Um, and maybe to also ask how can um, how can we track, sorry, we's missing there, how can we track extractive expansion without contributing to the resourcification of nature? And that resourcification is Val Plumwood's term. Um, and maybe this also has a little bit to do with kind of in the very title of our forum today, what 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 is the image that comes to mind when we think of resource hungry societies, for example? And I'm looking forward to your questions and to discussing this with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anke. And um, if we have some clarifying questions for Anke's presentation, um, we can ask them now. Uh, and then flow into the discussion. <laughs> but maybe some clarifying questions first. And if everything is clear, I will give the floor to uh, Benjamin Fleischmann, who is a PhD candidate at VOCU, and who will be um, facilitating this discussion. So don't hesitate to either um, raise your hand or um, write your questions in the chat and um, Benjamin will be moderating the discussion. So the floor is yours. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you. Ah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Technology is not my best friend. So, yeah. Um, so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to join this um, really interesting um, Pathways Forum. I think Colleen already introduced myself and I think we're also running a little bit late, so I skipped the part of introducing myself again. Um, but before we start the discussions, I just want to make a couple of remarks. So uh, I think to ensure that everybody has the sh chance to participate, I would kindly ask everyone um, to raise their virtually hands, their emoji hands, if, um, by, if you have any questions, call comments uh, or contributions and i then try to organize the order of people um, who want to uh, contribute and i would also ask you um, to be respectful and constructive in your discussions and also allow others to finish speaking uh, and yeah and also be a little bit brief in your contributions so everybody has the chance also to speak and of course, if somebody does not want to show their faces or want to speak in front of the audience, just to write something in the chat. And I try to give, uh, do my best to organize uh, that I can uh, post this question for you. So um, before we start um, with the comments and uh, the questions from the audience, I would um, start this discussions with some general follow-up questions um, to the speakers. And the first question would be, how can we define the boundaries of a system uh, when we do socio-metabolic analysis? So first, I would ask this question to uh, the speakers, and then maybe um, you guys can follow up and uh, give your comments. So whoever want to um, go on, Helmut, Anke, or? Well, I, I, can, I can say a little bit more on on the boundary definition underlying the, the stuff I have uh, been showing. This has emerged in long discussions um, in what is now industrial ecology, social ecology, uh, in studies looking at resource flows uh, at the, the national level. So basically the resource flows uh, associated with uh, national economies in the boundaries as we see them when we look at economic statistics. Uh, so we have a territorial boundary of a nation state. So we would look at the resource extraction on this territory. And then we would have physical import output, import export relationships of that nation national economy. And the definition of the boundary between natural stocks and flows, what we would call the natural processes uh, and socioeconomic depend, depends a little bit on, 
I mean, there are pragmatic issues to be solved. I can't go into any depth, but I don't think that's the point here. Uh, it's kind of related to where uh, materials or energies really are ex extracted from the ecosystem and enter economic uh, processing. Like uh, when when materials extracted from a mine where 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 trees are felled in in a forest and and taken away to to for some processing to to sown wood or whatever, uh, where where crops are harvested and there are some intricate issues about unused extraction, used extraction and so on that have to be considered when talking about that. Yeah. And at the output side, we also have the distinction between. Uh, stocks that are in use in an economy, like for example, if you have materials in houses, in roads, in cars, in whatever products, as long as they are used, then they may be hibernating. So they might be used, may abandon, but the product is still there, is still owned by somebody, and is not kind of give handed back to to the ecosystem at a certain point, it would be considered as, as handed back to, to nature in a way. And at that point, it would become a waste of an emission. Yeah. Can, can I add just uh, uh, a little bit? Of course, that was already very uh, thorough, Helmut, thank you. Um, I think what's also interesting to keep in mind that we can add, it depends on the research questions that we have, right? So we can, so these system boundaries, I would say they're, they're they're not arbitrary, but they're variable. So we can kind of, depending on what we want to be looking at, um, we, we can do that. And then the interesting thing is, of course, that how we set the system boundary says a lot about how we assume that our societies work, right? Because this idea of, of, of kind of what resources are useful or what stocks are in use can vary depending on kind of what we think about. And if we think about uh, the fact that, for example, in many countries, uh, if I uh, I own a plot of land and if there's building activity going on on it, then I pay less taxes than if it's kind of just lying dormant, right? So then stocks that are kind of just the, the basic structure of a building, they have an economic use because they mean that the person who owns that is paying less taxes, but they don't really have like a use that we think about in terms of providing accommodation for people, for example, right? Um, and the same way that if we're looking uh, to to uh, evaluate trade flows, right, then we, uh, we have this idea that either we can look at what crosses the boundary between two socioeconomic systems, so between two national economies, um, or we can look at all of the extraction, no matter where in the world, it occurs that is needed to satisfy a given level of final demand. But there we're already presupposing that this extraction is happening in order to satisfy final demand. But that's something that we could discuss, right? Why is that extraction happening? Also because someone has invested in a mine and needs to be mining something there in order for that investment to make sense. And isn't that kind of more of the reason why than kind of a given level of final demand? Not to say that one is a right way of looking at it and one is not, but to say that there are different ways and they always imply something about how we understand societies and the and the economic system. And then maybe I can just follow up also quickly um, that that um, it's the ext extractive and dissipative activities and the extractive and dissipative stocks that also are boundary making. So it's not only an analytical distinction, it's also um, a um, practical material fact or process that we have to study where, um, where what, and, and if we take, um, 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 if we take a, a clear cutting, um, leaving branches on the ground is not an extractive activity per se, but um, if we go towards natural renewable gas systems, then all of a sudden, oops, um, the way we deal with the branches becomes an extract extractive activity. So, so it's a moving process. So the boundary itself is is a real. We have to have a realistic approach um, in, in an epistemological sense, a critical realistic approach to the category of extraction and dissipation, which are which are social processes in and of themselves. Um, so, so to 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 and and these processes 
depending on their social context, can be picked up by the by by, by the statistics statistics we have or not. Um, um, I use wood from I'm pointing out my window right here, um, right about um, 20 meters from here to heat my house. That will not appear in the statistics because it's an informal practice. It's not one that is mediated, and thus will not appear in the any. But it is still a practice. So. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I think then we also would have the problems with uh, measuring um, processes within, within a, a country, like uh, trade, for instance, within Austria to have certain uh, um, statistics of the trade of Vienna and the hinterland and also other parts of Austria. It's not so, immer, it's not so um, trivial every time. So I guess this is also... Um, much work for the researchers to get the proper um, uh, data. And I guess, uh, yeah, I experienced it myself while doing the masters. So does everybody, anybody from the audience um, has a follow-up uh, question on this particular question? I f see that Anke wanted to add something. Is it is that right or no? Okay. Um, so are there any uh, questions on that matter from the audience? In terms of how we define um, what we want to find out, what what is the system boundaries, um, and then try to use this um, approach of social metabolic uh, analysis. Okay, so then I would come to the next question, which would be: I mean, you all of all of you three have already mentioned some linkages to other disciplines, how we can use. Um, the approach of social metabolism, of social metabolic research to engage disciplines like social sciences, natural sciences, humanities, and so on. I mean, Helmut, you already talked about the practice approach. Um, but in a more um, practical sense, in terms of also linking um, the different methods of social science, of natural science, can you give some examples uh, of, of uh, past uh, projects, for instance, where you really use this concept in a interdisciplinary way. And maybe you can also um, explain a little bit um, the difficulties, but also like the potentials uh, you saw there. Yeah, I can uh, get us started, uh, if that's OK. Um, so uh, uh, I started out uh, my or I started my research career out working kind of very exclusively with the social metabolism concept and with material flow accounting, which means I was just doing a lot of data work and calculations. Um, and then in actually in my PhD, I uh, began to work very closely uh, with a number of political scientists um, where we cooperated on case studies around resource uh, extraction uh, in different localities but tied together by kind of the, the, the resource requirements for the production of biofuels and what that entailed. Um, and that uh, for me, I think was a very, <laughs> entailed a very steep learning curve in terms of on the one hand, kind of having uh, this data available for us to be able to see, for example, the expansion of oil palm plantations in Indonesia and the, uh, the harvesting of uh, oil palm fruit for uh, processing into oil and for export and all of these things that becomes very tangible if we can look at it in terms of material flow data. But on the other hand, um, also having to acknowledge that if we look at it through these numbers, that there's a lot that we can't see, right? We can't see who are the actors that are involved, what's the decision-making process, why is there this orientation towards uh, export, what does that mean for the local population, um, and that in some ways the, the tools that I thought were answering all the questions we might have actually also raised a lot of questions. But I think that that's really uh, such a productive de point of departure um, for for interdisciplinary work is to to have that realization that hey I you know my work is raising questions that I can't answer but actually I think you might be able to help me out and then that can sort of be a, a mutual process so I think that that's something 
this this uh, cooperation into well political sciences specifically then political ecology but also uh political economy of course many different schools in political economy so depending on on the particular school but i think that's something that's that's been like very productive in both directions right in in informing the research eric or, or helmut uh, do you want to follow up um, have you any any um, comments on this? Maybe quickly and then Helmut can finish. Um, me, it was the opposite process of ANCA. <laughs> um, so I was working with um, a political economy framework and trying to understand extractive activities um, around oil and around forest products um, and um, not having the not having the tools to be able to to um, visualize and analyze the material dimensions to these processes. So for me, coming into the social metabolism approach was a way to complement and rapidly um, had forced me to open up um, the conceptuality that I had of the economic process to go towards these four moments that I didn't. I was working with regulation school approaches, which are all basically focus on production and consumption and, and, and the compatibility between both and not um, didn't have a specific way to understand extraction. So so for me, that was the way. Yeah. Well, um, perhaps perhaps I should um, uh, I, I should say I was uh, perhaps <laughs> I'm, I'm working with this concept for a very long time now. So basically more than 30 years. So I have used it in many, many different co contexts. Uh, I mean, in the in the early '90s, when we started to develop these concepts, uh, uh, it was primarily also seen as a means to link social and natural science approaches in analyzing environmental problems. And the the, the basic thought that Marina Fischer Kowalski had was that if we want to do something about the environment, we don't have to primarily focus on describing how how the environment changes and focusing on on analyzing these things but we have to understand what we as a society do uh, to change the environment to, to, and to and what our our activities mean in sustainability terms like for example for the climate or for biodiversity so kind of looking at sustainability from from a very different angle um and um i mean if you I think the most the most influential use of the concept I have uh, in 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 what what I have been doing over the past decades was probably that it helped to to come up with a more realistic appreciation of global bioenergy potentials. To when when I entered uh, these global assessment processes first in the global energy assessment in the around uh, 15 years ago, and then later in the fifth uh, IPCC assessment report in Working Group 3, uh, the consensus estimate for global bioenergy potentials for 2050 was around 400 to 500 exajoules. Uh, and uh, I don't know who of you knows what exajoules are, but this is about as much energy as humanity currently gets from fossil fuels. Yeah, uh, And when when we were starting to do that that work, I mean, and when we entered that debate, we kind of just looked at, I mean, what is the amount of bio, what is the energy equivalent of all biomass mobilized by humans for their social metabolism for all purposes? Uh, and then we found out this was 220 exajoules, and this included all the biomass we needed to feed ourselves, uh, to feed the livestock that we feed upon, <laughs> Uh, for the, the wood we need for construction and, of course, the bioenergy that was in use, which was kind of thought to be around 50 exajoules at that, right? So going to 500 exajoules for energy alone, which meant uh, multiplying bioenergy use by a factor of 10, was something that we found outrageous because we knew that to gain these 200, 220 or whatever exajoules, humans used about three quarters of the Earth's land. 
and not much fertile land was left at all. Yeah. So we said this cannot be right. And then we started to use this social metabolism approach to build models where we could look at what it really would mean to get these 500 exajoules. And we found you cannot get them. Uh, and, and if you look at the fifth assessment report, why I was also contributing the, the, the consensus estimates for global bioenergy potentials in, 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 in 2050 uh, seems to converge around 100 to 150 exajoules. So a factor three to factor five reduction of the expectations. And we are now aware that even getting these 100 to 150 exajoules will be very hard to do it sensibly by respecting, you know, our targets in terms of biodiversity conservation, avoiding ecological degradation and so on. Yeah. So I think this was a really massive change in perspective. And the key thing here was that we were able to understand the interlinkages or the trade-offs between using land for bioenergy versus using it for other purposes, like, for example, feeding livestock which was the most important one. The, the most important trade-off was uh, using land for either bioenergy or feeding uh, feeding livestock. Yeah, And so this was kind of, if this is perhaps a story that can show how you can use this approach. Yeah, but uh, I could tell more. <laughs> yeah. Can I, I mean, add one? Yeah. Sorry, just one tiny thing that would also speak to one of the questions that were raised in the chat just mm -hmm. very quickly because there was this question around like more qualitative studies right and i think that that's also um something that can be hugely important in what we can actually learn to understand through the social metabolism concept are these studies that are based uh on interviews and participant observations that track not only what are households or communities using in terms of resources but also what social significance do they attach to what they use how they use it what do they use for something that's often or that still continues to be very difficult for us to understand at the level of a nation state or a city, um, but that actually these studies that focus on communities and on households um, have begun to make very clear um, and have begun to show us kind of that uh, how how resources you know can can actually add to well being. Uh, beyond kind of just the the usual things that we think about well you need food to eat no but you also need to uh you you might that might be part of your social interaction to uh, acquire food in a market setting and it might be part of your social cohesion and the family to eat together and so then we we get into factors that we can't cover if we're uh, if we're following our ton fetishes and so I think those studies are also really important that have looked at these aspects in conjunction Yeah, uh, thank you, Anke, for already also um, addressing one question um, of the chat. Speaking of which, I would just go through the questions. We are some. Um, the first one, okay, that's it's, it's a funny one, actually. But I also asked myself this question, is there any difference between these different uh, terms of metabolism? So is there any difference between social metabolism, between socioeconomic metabolism, sometimes you also heard like industrial metabolism is this just a, a term is this just a problem of notion or is there is there are there some differences well there is a difference between industrial and social metabolism because social metabolism is, is more broad i mean it also applies to agrarian societies to hunter gatherer societies industrial metabolism applies only to to industrial society so uh, apart from that, whether you you call it social metabolism or socioeconomic metabolism, I don't think. I mean, different people prefer different words here, but there, I think there's not a big difference in meaning, at least not to me. <laughs> okay, thank you, um, Helmut. Um, I see Kevin's hand, but I would just go on with the questions from the um, the chat, but I don't forget you, Kevin, and then I will come to your question. The next uh, question of Sandrine is um, a, a broader one. Uh, could you tell us more about the social metabolism research agenda today? What are the key research questions and directions? Um, and the second one would be, could you give us examples of how 
Social metabolism research is able to provide public policies with useful data, tools, and frameworks. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, who wants to start? I can always go 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 at it just rapidly and then let it to the others. But me, the what I'm trying to work on recently is um, to look at uh, how fixed capital works inside the um, stock flow um, practice nexus and how um, um, fixed capital accumulation, either in tangible and tangible forms through the investment relation, can act as a as an, a mechanism of inertia. And how can we understand that process? So that that's that's yeah, and that has a really big impacts on how we understand transition or socio-ecological transformation. This fixed capital relation. Uh, and I think that actually ties in very nicely to something that Helmut had hoped I would speak about, and I didn't speak about uh, about kind of this the also the the legacy effect of stocks, right? And if we look at kind of built infrastructures and what we now know about the impact that has not just on the resources that are tied up in these infrastructures because they're required to build them, um, but then how these these uh, these stocks funnel all future resource flows, right? It makes a huge difference whether we're investing uh, a lot of construction materials to build uh, a railway network uh, as China is currently doing, for example, or as was the case in the United States of America during a similar phase of economic development, whether we're building a transport network that's based on uh, on air travel, for example, right? And and so then we, we determine a lot of future resource use, but also a lot of... Um, questions around accessibility uh, of uh, mobility in that case um, through what's happening. And I think that this makes uh, social metabolism research, for example, um, also makes it very relevant for environmental movements, right? Because uh, what, uh, what they are already doing without necessarily having studied social metabolism is that they're, they are contesting kind of the building up of these infrastructures, right? There's so much protest against hydroelectric dams or against runways or against airports or against highways for individualized motor vehicle uh, transport and, and to be able to, or generally against fossil fuel infrastructures, right? And to be able to offer also that kind of support to the social or to the social and environmental movements um, that, that lends further further credibility not that it's necessary but in some context it is further credibility to what they're already claiming i think that can be something that's that's also very well has practical relevance well i think I, I want to mention three activities one is uh the boring stuff of building enormous databases that quantify social metabolism both in terms of, of flows and stocks so I have just finishing a large project where we've done that uh, to a very large extent. And we have been mapping uh, material stocks globally with uh, very high resolution, even down to 90 meters with very high thematic resolution, distinguishing buildings, roads and whatnot. And also building very long time series of uh, material stocks and flows in national economies using a quite detailed socio-metabolic model that distinguishes 13 different steps of production and consumption, yeah, uh, 15 materials and works on a national gl level globally for the last 120 years. And through that we produced massive databases. And at, at the moment we are also trying to use these databases to understand uh, socio-metabolic requirements, for example, for, uh, for good living, for example, for, for years of good life that people may expect to have in different uh, nations uh, and, and, and similar questions. Another thing is, and this is quite straightforward, obviously you can use these databases to assess how circular economies really are in a macro perspective not on the product level, but for the level of whole economies. And we're in a project together with YASA and many others, where we look at the circular economy uh, and thereby all very much focus on the demand side, not only on when you have all this production going on, how can you close the circle at the back end of social metabolism? How can you recycle the waste? But what can you do to reduce material inputs? Because 
you know, in the in the end, all the inputs will eventually sometimes end up as outputs. There are lim thermodynamic limits to recycling, yeah. And so, if you really want to become sustainable, you have to limit the inputs, uh, uh, not only the outputs, <laughs> recycle the outputs. And the new project that we've just gotten approved, it's a quite big project, and Anke is involved in that as well. Uh, we want to look at how uh, the current geopolitical tensions, wars, pandemics, all these uh, crisis phenomena that we increasingly see, and that it are more events, yeah, uh, that may be stochastic. Some supply routes are blocked or disturbed disrupted, uh, how we can understand what that actually means for the resilience of economies, for our ability to provide people with a good life, uh, and also for our efforts to move towards sustainability. Because, and, and for that, you need to be able to understand social metabolism, not as we currently do as a rather linear stock flow system, yeah? Uh, but you have to understand it as a complex network system that can have tipping points, that can have non-linearities that may change in unexpected ways when you, for example, block certain shipping roads, uh, routes. Yeah, uh, and, and this is a massive methodological development because we also teamed up with people who do these big data-based uh, complex system models. But we also teamed up with people like Anke and others from uh, political ecology who try to understand the provisioning systems that, that are important for providing us with services and, 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 and uh, uh, things that we actually need for a good life, like being able to nourish ourselves, have living space, have mobility systems. And there we want to understand how these stochastic e effects change these networks, but also change our abilities to provide these essential well-being contributions. So that's that's for the next five years. So, and I'm not sure to what extent we can really uh, solve it, but we hope to make some progress at least. So I guess we have to have another Pathways Forum after five years and then you can... For sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, the second question was that, okay, how how does this help us to provide like useful data tools and frameworks for public policy, for policymakers? I mean, I know that MFA, for instance, material flow accounting is already part of a statistical assessment of the EU. So if you want to have data on the, the nation states, um, member states, um, consumption of, of, of um, goods and materials, you can looked it up. So I think this is one part of it. And then you could also develop scenarios, forward uh, looking assessments on different uh, policy uh, measures, for instance. But uh, I don't know if you also have to add up something. Um, but otherwise, I would uh, go to the next question, if this that's OK. Um, next question is from Cedric. Uh, thanks for the interesting talks. Have you ever heard about, okay, Anke already um, addressed this question, so I would also um, go to the next because we're also running a little bit late. Um, another one would be a question to Anke. Thank you very much for the inspiring presentation. You explained very well the problems, conflicts between infinite ec economic growth and finite planet and resources. What about solutions? Where is the way out of the climate and ecological crisis? Is green is green econo economic development compatible with a livable planet? Big question for you, Anke. I hope yeah, you can answer it. <laughs> exactly. I will. I will tell you now all what the solution is. No, but uh, in all seriousness, thank you very much for this question, and I think it's also a a valid point in the sense that I think we're. From the social metabolic perspective, we tend to be very good at identifying the problems. And then even if we're presented with solutions as at picking those apart and seeing, well, if we look at this economy wide, we see that there are repercussions um, and we're not as good uh, as coming up with solutions. So I think that's uh, in terms of the perspective, I, I think that's an, a, 
uh, well, perhaps a weakness or, or something that's kind of without out, outside of the scope of this approach that we should acknowledge. Um, on the other hand, I think that if we take the socio -meta metabolism research together with insights we have from other research areas and also from our lived experience as human beings in under capitalism, which I think is also a very valid source of information, then I think we really have to say that the uh, that that capitalism and whether it's called green capitalism or not, that it's fundamentally part of the problem, right? On the one hand, because it does require, it requires the growth that we've seen so far. This is kind of not uh, uh, something that just happened to coincide, but it's something that's uh, systemically part of the capitalist economic system. Um, and in the slide that Helmut uh, sort of had to uh, cover relatively quickly, uh, we did in a very systematic uh, review of literature and of data, try to have a look at whether there are, are any economic systems that are able to sustain uh, economic growth without also growing uh, their, their level of resource use. And there really uh, aren't. Um, and at the same time, I think we also have to look at uh, the the uh, at capitalism and its impact on our social relations, right? And then we have to ask ourselves: Is this kind of, or do we feel like we're living uh, our our best lives? It's just that it has a lot of environmental impact, and we should somehow address that. And then I think the the answer really has to be no. That there are so many other things uh, in terms of social inequalities, but also in terms of quality of life, right? Like the, the levels of stress, the impact on social relations, this emphasis on uh, competition rather than cooperation, um, all of these things that, that don't make capitalism a very pleasant system uh, to live in. Um, and so I think it is worth uh, very seriously thinking about alternatives and about alternatives um, for which we do at least already have uh, uh, evidence either at the community level, right, where we where we look at to what extent is it possible um, to to uh, at least envision alternative futures there, um, but then also alternatives, of course, theoretically, if we if we think about uh, uh, envisioning and planning for an economic system um, that does not require growth to uh, to function. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, uh, Anke. Um... I think that Kevin still um, had a question. I don't, do you still have the question? Yeah. Yeah, I still have a question. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks you. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, I have a more general comment that is maybe uh, directed towards you three. Um, so I'm a postdoc researcher in Montpellier and I'm a physicist working on water and information stock flow and their circular dynamics. And I'm reflecting about how is knowledge put into action. So first, I wanted to rebound on the end of Helmut's talk concerning the practice iceberg and the, the three levels you are mentioning, the materials, knowledge, and meaning, if, I, if I'm right, makes me think about the law of thermodynamics and the, the uh, biophysical perspective on information, information see, seen as, uh, as in a biology. Uh, for example, or evolution, which I am linking actually uh, currently with a, a more territorial perspective developed by colleagues working on information and communication in Montpellier. So here is the question for you, Helmut. Uh, why don't you bring in some of your perspectives uh, about LTIR, long-term social ecological research platform here? I think there is room for reflection about how change happens in collaborative uh, uh, settings and about the role of researchers in the providing uh, of knowledge and educational and informational services. And then uh, I wanted to comment on the metabolic structure of the economic process sketched by Eric. I found it very useful to, to think about what information we use is and their very specificity with regard to other kind of resources. And when, when then you talk about anthropic transformation in an economic perspective and as a physicist, I'm not totally convinced about the 2D graph you showed. What is your definition of entropy and how is this concept put into variable and quantified and is it? And finally, Ank, I completely join you concerning the introduction of your talk. I come to the same conclusion in my reading of metabolism, the development of tools, the possibility to expand upon social metabolism, to produce order and narratives about what the problems are the need for more reflective research about to empower societies in the face of the crisis we are facing. Yeah. 
How social metabolism may help build new ways to practice research? Can it become a way to speed up a sort of interdisciplinary inquiry? And once the model or provisioning system is made more visible with a critical opening of black boxes, the location, the resource uses, and basically all the, the, the difficulties with regard to information sharing, what can we do? So this was a, a, a kind of critical comment, but I think it's okay with you. And uh, I, I really want to discuss with you uh, more about this. I will be in Vienna actually in April. So maybe Anke and Helmut, it, it would be an opportunity to, to meet. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for these questions. Um, I would ask everybody of you to just give a brief uh, answer because we only have five minutes left. And uh, like Kevin said, you can follow up uh, this discussion in Vienna in person, which is nice. So thank you very much. Helmut, do you want to start? Yeah, well, I'm not sure whether I fully got the point about, uh, about information. Uh, but uh, I can comment on, I mean, really, we can perhaps discuss this personal when you are in Vienna. I would be pleased to do so. Um, the LTSER platforms, I'm very much in favor of this, this, this concept, and I'm actually also involved, not very much, because my time is quite limited, but uh, my colleague Veronika Gauber is directly involved in, in, in further developing this concept. So the idea is to create um, research sites where you have not only uh, a lot of, of facilities to measure all kinds of uh, ecological parameters consistently over time and space, but also to, to, to uh, include uh, parameters that are important for social and socio-ecological research like and and we try to come up with uh, data requirements uh, that should be provided by these emerging LTSER platforms that are currently being built as a European research infrastructure and I think that for example land use land cover data including data on, on built up land and its qualities should be a core uh, part of that. But there's of, of course a lot more parameters that should be systematically and comparably over time and space be collected at these research platforms uh, for future long-term sociological research. Eric, do you want to follow up? Yeah, rapidly. It's a question that I've received before by other people with um, a background in physics, um, and it's a it's um, I'd say an understanding an understanding that comes from um, Judge Skorogin's economics. So the way he uses and transforms the concept, of course. Um, so so the arrow of biophysical work is also could also be understood as one from order to disorder in a very general way and, and attached to dissipative um, activities, either of energy or materials. So that's that's the way it, it, it is used. But I, I do understand that it could be understood in a strictly physical sense as a, as a problem to organize it, though, though it does, I mean, it, it does, if we, in terms of energy, work very well, then, then for materiality, I know that there are debates around that question. Of course, social, it, it one could replace entropic transformations with irreversibility. That would be. Uh, and then maybe just kind of very quickly the the question of uh, of what can we do and and where are we moving to with with social metabolism research? I think um, in terms of uh, also in terms of practical implications or implications that are meaningful to people in everyday lives, I think it, the the approach is still vastly under uh, utilized or underexploited in a way, especially because uh, if we talk to people, for example, the the outside of academia and outside of this bubble, the first application that always comes to mind is this idea. Uh, of better informing consumption choices, right? That that through social metabolism research, we can find out the carbon, excuse me, the carbon footprint of uh, a product, and then we can choose the uh, the product that has the lower carbon footprint. But of course, 
that's very, very tightly within sort of this uh, actually green capitalism framework. Um, and so I think that that's really something that's worth uh, thinking more about how this can become relevant. And I think it is happening, for example, at the level of urban uh, research, where, where we've, we're seeing some attempts to link social metabolism perspectives with, for example, concepts of the 15-minute city or of super blocks, and to sort of see at that level of the lived experience uh, of urban residents, um, what does this mean and what does this relate to? And in uh, a framework that's a little bit larger and perhaps also more influential than trying to make the right consumption choices in a, in a supermarket. So we only have uh, a couple of second, seconds left. So there would be like one last question, but I already read through it and I guess it's uh, too long uh, to answer it in this uh, short time. So I would um, unfortunately end the, this session. Thank you very much for this interesting discussions. Thank you very much for your questions and to that you um, joined this uh, forum. And now I would hand over um, to Colleen. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I join you in your thanks for this interesting discussion. Um, thank you, everyone, for your question, and thank you warmly to uh, Anke, Eric, and Helmut uh, for coming, and Benjamin, uh, thank you so much for facilitating the discussion. Um, for everyone who's present, don't, we will be sending the, not sending, we will be publishing the recording uh, on our website and on YouTube in a couple of days. Uh, we'll notify you when everything is ready, and we will also send you a reading list uh, that we have compiled uh, with interesting articles of the speakers, but also others, other perspectives on social metabolism. Um, also, don't hesitate to follow us on uh, LinkedIn. You can find us under the Pathways Initiative and sign up for our newsletter. Uh, Pavel is going to be sending the links in the chat. And um, we can, I'm also re really happy to already announce the topic of our next forum, which will be, um, the date is not completely uh, clear yet, but if you sign up to a, our newsletter, you will have the news when you when they will be ready. Our next forum is gonna be on, um, we're gonna be continuing our uh, series on decolonizing sustainability science, um, where we will be discussing with indigenous researchers on how to engage with indigenous communities. So it's a very different topic, but um, I hope it will interest some of you as well. And uh, yeah, I really hope to see some of you um, again in the future. And if you have any questions uh, that weren't answered, I suppose you can always reach out to the speakers um, if you definitely need to ask your pressing questions. So yeah, thank you for uh, giving us some insights into how sociometabolism can help transform our understanding of our societies, our economies, um, and also how we can better understand the narratives of transition, green growth, and everything that we better that we keep hearing. And I think socio-metabolism socio is a really interesting way of um, maybe opening up some interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary researchers as well. So I, um, yeah, I thank you very warmly and I thank uh, everyone who was present and asked your very interesting questions. And I will see you next time. <laughs>